Hi class, here we are going to be talking about chapter 4. So this is specifically looking at reactions that are taking place in an aqueous solution, meaning that the substances have been dissolved in water. So we're working with what are called solutions. So to be a solution, you have to be a homogeneous mixture. So recall a couple of chapters ago, we talked about how that's a uniform mixture when two, th two or more things mix together and they produce a uniform um, solution or mixture. So here an example might be salt and water. So think about if salt and water mix really well, they'll mix together and it'll be the same throughout. Whereas sand and water, if you put those two things together, no matter how much you stir, it will stay heterogeneous. It will not go into a homogeneous solution because the two will not evenly distribute, okay? So if we talk about the components here of a solution, so we're focusing on when two or more substances mix uniformly, you have two components. You have the solvent, which is your majority component. So that's the one that is there in the greatest quantity. This is typically going to be water, especially for us because we're focusing on aqueous solutions. So if you see this little AQ, that indicates that the substance has been dissolved in water. But that does not have to be the solvent in all solutions. There are others. Um, solutes, there could be one or more that have been dissolved into the solvent. So, for example, you could have salt, right? So, table salt in ACL. You could have carbon dioxide gas. You could have one or more solutes that have been mixed into the solvent, okay? So, what determines why salt dissolves in water but not sand, right? This brings up this um, little saying, like dissolves like. It ends up mattering, does the solute like the solvent? If the two have things in common, they will mix really well. That's called being very soluble, and they will um, create a homogeneous mixture. So salt and water, they like each other, and they're similar. Whereas sand and water are not, and that's why they will not dissolve. They'll instead try to separate, just like oil and water will try to separate. We are going to discuss a little bit of this topic later in the course, but for now what we're going to say, and I'm going to just X out this original example here, that in general, ionic compounds, and if you'll recall, ionic compounds, a metal and a non-metal, right, are generally very soluble very soluble in water. We will see some exceptions, and that's fine. But for now, I want you to know that. Ionic compounds are generally very soluble in water. Molecular compounds, remember if you're in molecular compound, you are made up of all non-metals. Does that make sense? Molecular compounds are generally less soluble in water. Generally less soluble in water. That is something that will come back up in chapter 9 and we'll talk about the concept of polarity. But for now we want to say, okay, if you're ionic, I know you're going to dissolve in water or I'm going to predict that you do. So here you see NaCl is ionic, so I would predict yes, those two things will mix. C3H8 is a molecular compound because it's all nonmetals, so we're going to say no, we predict that it will not dissolve in water. This is not a 100% rule, but we can lean towards one side or the other to make a prediction right now, okay? Now, what we end up talking about here is this concept of dissociation. So if you think about what it means to just dissolve, if something dissolves, all that means is it intermixes with the water, okay? It just mixes. It makes a homogeneous mixture. If something dissociates, that's where this word is coming into play, if something dissociates, that means it's actually breaking into ions in solution. This is very characteristic of ionic compounds because they are composed of ions. So what this means is like when NaCl, when you take salt and you put it into water, right? When you put it into water, we know it dissolves, right? You can make salt water where you no longer see the salt. It's just intermixed. 
But what we know is it also dissociates, which means it actually breaks into its ions. So it breaks into its pieces. That is called dissociation, and that changes the characteristics and behavior of a mixture, of a solution. So here we're going to start talking about who does this and who doesn't do this. So if you dissociate, you break in the ions. If you don't dissociate, that just means you stay intact as your unit. You might still spread out in solution and dissolve, but you're not breaking into your individual pieces, okay? And we'll talk more about that as we go. The way we um, characterize these is by calling them electrolytes and non-electrolytes. So here, electrolytes in general are going to be these ions that are produced in solution. So if you're thinking about a Gatorade or a drink that has electrolytes in it for your body, that's referring to ions that our body needs, such as calcium and chloride. So different ions that are going to be in a solution. So there's electrolytes and there's non-electrolytes. We're going to further break this down into these three categories right here. And we want to be able to predict and put compounds into these three categories and know what it means. To be a strong electrolyte, this means that you are going to completely dissociate. Completely dissociate when you dissolve. This could also be called 100% dissociation, if that makes sense. So every compound that goes into solution will break apart, just like salt. And I'll talk about who they are here in a minute. A weak electrolyte, well, let's go to non actually next. Non-electrolyte, there's no dissociation. It doesn't mean that the substance can't mix with water. It's just saying even if it mixes, it does not break into ions. So you're not going to have these charged particles. That's what we're really looking for. If you're an electrolyte, then you have charged particles floating around in the solution. If you're a non-electrolyte, there's no dissociation. No ions produced at all. Does that make sense? A weak electrolyte is in the middle. Partial dissociation is what we say. What this means is only a very small amount of your compounds break apart, okay? So here, it's not always 5%, but I'm going to put about 5% of your compounds dissociate. So does that make sense that 5 out of 100 break into ions, but 95 of them stay intact? So you have very little dissociation. So what would be your answer? Do you have ions? Yes. Do you have a lot of ions? No. So the weak electrolytes, there will be a little bit of dissociation, but very little. Most of the particles stay together as a molecule. So now let's go ahead and identify who goes into what category here, okay? A strong electrolyte can be one of three um, options. It can be an ionic compound. I'm just going to start here because you're the most familiar with that. An ionic compound, metal and nonmetal, okay? NaCl calcium chloride, sodium phosphate, so ionic compounds. Also, strong acids and strong bases. We are going to need to memorize these two lists, okay? You need to be able to identify strong acids. They're going to all start with H, and there are these specific ones listed here. They break apart in ions in solution. That's actually what makes them a strong acid, is they produce a bunch of hydrogen ions because they break apart and dissociate. Strong bases, they all have the hydroxide anion, and it's mostly group one and group two metals. So you'll also want to list and memorize um, who the strong bases are. There is a chapter four handout provided, and it has stuff you'll use for this chapter down here. It tells you to memorize anything that's in red. So the strong acids are listed in red, and the strong bases are listed in red. And that's in order to remind you we need to know who those are because they are strong electrolytes. Weak electrolytes are weak acids. How are we going to know if you're a weak acid? Well, you're going to know you're an acid because they start with H, okay? Start with the hydrogen ion. Does that make sense? But they're not on the strong list. So start with H, but not a strong acid. So some examples might be HF. You see how it starts with an H, but it's not on the strong list. Or HNO2. 
It starts with an H, but it's not on that list. Or acetic acid, C2, or H, C2, H3, O2. These are examples of weak acids. We don't give you a list of these because there's, there's so many. Instead, you learn the strong acids, and then you know everybody else is weak. So what we know is when you put HF into solution, a small amount of them will break apart in H plus and F minus, but most of them will stay together. And then the non-electrolytes are the molecular compounds, okay? They're all non-metals, and they are not going to dissociate, partially because they're not made of ions. So um, any molecular compounds that are all non-metals will not dissociate in solution, okay? An example would be um, glucose, C6H12O6. You see how it's all nonmetals? Um, it is soluble. It will dissolve to some extent, but it will not dissociate. Okay? So here, let's talk about how we can classify and do a little bit of practice. Classify these as strong, weak, or non-electrolyte. So essentially, you're identifying each into one of those categories. Okay, CaCl2. It starts with a metal. Remember, you're going to start with one of three things. You're going to start with a metal, which makes you ionic. Start with an H, with, which makes you an acid. Or you start with a non-metal, which makes you molecular. Those are your three options. So here, since you start with a metal, you are ionic. So if you are ionic, what category is that? Ionic are strong electrolytes. HNO3. Okay, ding, 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 we start with an H, so you're an acid. You've got to go see if you're on the strong list. Yes, you are. So since you're on a strong list, you're a strong acid. Strong acid, and therefore, you are a strong electrolyte. Okay, ethanol here, C's, H's, O's. Okay, you don't start with an H, you don't start with a metal, you do start with a non-metal. You're all non-metal, so you're molecular. And if you're in molecular, then you're not electrolyte. HCHO2. You don't have to know who he is, but you see that he starts with an H, right? If he starts with an H, he is an acid. You go see if he's on the strong list. He is not. This is formic acid. It's what's in the red ant sting. Um, so here's your formic acid. You are a weak acid, and weak acids are our weak electrolytes. And then lastly, KOH. Okay, there's two ways to classify this. Number one, K is a metal, so you are ionic. You would go ahead and predict yes. And it's on the strong base list. So I'm going to list strong base, but also he is ionic. Either way, you get to the same conclusion that he's a strong electrolyte. Okay, so let's try again. How many ions are present in each of the following strong electrolytes? So here we're actually already told that they're strong. We're just breaking them apart to see how many ions we're producing. So here, what's happening is we have nickel plus two and sulfate. And we only have one of each, so that gives us two ions. B, calcium nitrate. See how you get one calcium ion in solution? When this breaks apart, you see how you're gonna get two nitrates? NO3 minus, NO3 minus. You see how you got two nitrates, one calcium, so you have a total of three ions. You see how that produces more ions than nickel sulfate? Okay, here, what do you get? You get three sodiums, do you agree? Three sodiums, and one phosphate. So I could write that out. You get three sodiums, we're just looking at the formula, and one phosphate, that's a three for phosphate. So you see how that's going to give you a total of four ions, so even more. And then this guy, you get two aluminums and three sulfates, so five. Why this matters is because one big characteristic of an electrolyte in solution is that it's going to conduct electricity. The more ions present, the greater the conductivity of that solution. Okay, so that would be the one that would produce the most ions. That's exactly what this next one's asking, is if you put equal amounts into a solution of different solutes, we're going to go through and see which ones and will dissolve and um, which ones will dissociate and then determine their electrical conductivity compared to each other. So what we're going to do here is go through and first identify who's going to dissociate. So calcium nitrate, you think on your own first. Try to classify him 
as strong, weak, or non. So go through and do that for each of these and then let's compare. Okay, you have four substances. Okay, so let's come up, see what y'all came up with. So here, calcium nitrate, you're looking at what it starts with. It starts with a metal, which means it is ionic. So if it's ionic, that means it is a strong electrolyte. Okay, here's glucose, it says, C6H12O6. It does not start with H, so it's not an acid. It doesn't start with a metal, so it's not ionic. It's molecular. If it's molecular, that means non-electrolyte. It will produce no ions. Sodium acetate, immediately sodium is a metal, so you're ionic, strong electrolyte. And then HC2H3O2, so acetic acid here. We start with an H, so we're an acid, we go to our list. He is not strong, that means he's weak. He's a weak acid, which means he's a weak electrolyte. Okay, so that was our first step. Now we actually need to rank them to, to indicate which ones have the most ions present. Well, y'all tell me this first. Who has no ions present at all? Who does not break up at all? That's glucose, right? So he's going to be the worst. C6H12O6. He's going to be a terrible conductor, meaning non-conductor. Okay? He has no ions. Next, who's going to be the next weakest? Well, remember we said weak electrolytes barely break up. So the acetic acid is going to be next. He will conduct electricity, but not very well because he's a weak electrolyte. Now we have to compare the two strong ones, right? They're both breaking apart fully. Do you remember what we talked about right here? We need to compare the number of ions. So how many ions are you gonna get from calcium nitrate? See how you're gonna get one calcium and two nitrates, so you're gonna get three ions there? How many are you gonna get here? You're gonna get one sodium, and one acetate, so you're gonna get two ions. So y'all think, which one's the better conductor? The best conductor has the most ions, right? So we're gonna see that sodium acetate comes next, and then the very best one is the one with the most ions, calcium nitrate, okay? All right, here next, we are gonna be looking at precipitation reactions.